What a wonderful time of worship this morning. I have to, I have to think that that was somewhat similar to what the shepherds heard. It was a joyful sound. It was a declaration. It was a pro, pro proclamation. There you go. I'll get the right, right emphasis there. It was a definite uh, establishment of something that was greater than their present situation. And aren't you glad that Jesus is greater than your present situation? I am as well. I want to say thank you so much to those of you who prayed for my family this week. It has been a full week. And uh, I thank God for his faithfulness through it all. I want to thank those of you who have participated in various things to make things happen. This sanctuary has, was full on last night with a wedding and uh, had all kinds of people here. It was just a great opportunity. I saw a sign this week that says, gobble till you wobble. <laughs> gobble till you wobble. Do we have any guilty among us? <laughs> Did you eat enough to enjoy? and be satisfied, or did you eat enough to regret it? <laughs> Amen. It has been a wonderful, filled month of November, and uh, now as we walk into the month of December, we want to make sure everybody got an outline. We are going to be focusing, as we should, every month on exalting Jesus. We have honored many different careers, many different individuals. Uh, last month we honored our military, uh, we've honored teachers, we've honored the pastor, we've honored clergy, those different designations we have throughout the year. Because I do believe that if we are an honoring, if we honor God, we will honor what God honors. If we love God, we'll love what God loves and we'll hate what God hates. How many of you know that God does hate something? Right. You aware of that? For those of you that don't know, because we have this idea out here that somehow God is this all-loving God, which he is. But God hates something. The Bible clearly states in the Old Testament and the New Testament that God hates sin. Matter of fact, he hates so much that he made a way for mankind, the apple of his eye, that was, which was created in his image, to have a way of escape in order that they could live free from that sin. And that really is... The, the, the story, in a sense, about what Christmas is about. It's about the love of God. It's about the reality of being, of remembering and being reminded. Remembering that we have a way of salvation. And Romans says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And we've got to realize that this time of year is not meant to be buried underneath a lot of things, a lot of stuff, but it is meant to give us an opportunity to shine. You will respond one way or another. One person wrote this, the purpose of Christmas, is it a religious holiday to celebrate the birth of Jesus? Some would say, yeah, that's what it's all about. Others would say, eh. What about this? Is it a reason to enjoy winter festivities, food, and fun? Is it a time, or is it a time to build together, to gather together, to build family traditions, to maintain family traditions, or establish culture, or establish memories? The Bible says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. That everything, to everything, there is a season, a time to every purpose under heaven. I want to answer the question today, what is the purpose of Christmas? And I realize that I'm talking to people who already know. But I hope today it will brush the dust of 11 months off your memory, off of your faith, and allow you to be able to, once again, boldly declare at this time to your neighbors, to your loved ones, to your co-workers, and even reminding yourself the purpose for this season. 
Would you read the Ecclesiastes 3, 1 with me again? You've got it at the top of your outline. Let's read it out loud together. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Christmas is a time of celebration. It's the first blank on there, and I don't have the overhead today to, to spell it. So you know what? If you want to spell it phonetically, it's between you and God. <laughs> but the truth is, Christmas is a time of celebration. Consider with me Luke chapter 2, verse 10 through 14. The angel said unto them, Fear not, the them here is the shepherds. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you this day is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace goodwill toward men. It goes on in verse 20 to say, The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. Understand that the, the Christian mindset coming to this time of year is not to add to or to take away from the gospel story. It is simply to be reminded that a Savior was necessary. A Messiah was not only prophesied, but a Messiah was anticipated by the Jews at that time. And by the world who had fallen into sin, looking, striving for some form of salvation from the death and the weight of sin that had been carried for generations, for thousands of years. Now there was going to be an answer to the problem. The problem of man trying to do their own thing. The problem of man trying to play boss. The problem of man trying to promote himself to deity. The problem of man trying to control all things could now be settled and rested on the shoulders of the Messiah. Isaiah declared that upon his shoulders the government would rest. You know what happens when the government does what it's supposed to do? You and I can do what we're supposed to do, right? And when the government doesn't do what they're supposed to do, what happens? You try to be the government, absolutely. The revolts, the, the revolutions, the, the coups, all these kinds of things ultimately come about because somebody isn't doing their job. Well, can I tell you today that when the Messiah came, it was a time to celebrate because the Jews understood that when the Messiah came, he was going to take the government upon his shoulder and all they had to do was follow him and, and, and experience the joy of being able to rest under the shadow of his wing. How many of you would love to have Jesus walk into our White House, into our capitals, into our mayor's office, and begin to rest the government of, of this people, of this nation, upon his shoulder to rule? If you know Jesus, you know he'd do such a good job. If you don't know him, you might be wondering, you know, maybe we need somebody like Santa Claus. <laughs> maybe we need somebody else who could do the job. Oh, let me tell you, when he came, he came bringing peace on earth, goodwill to men. Do we not need peace on this earth? Do we still not need goodwill? We need this generosity of love one for another. But I'm going to tell you what, if it isn't here, it's not coming out here. And so what did Jesus do? He came as an infant. He came, as the, as the angels declared to the shepherds, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Why? Because people typically aren't afraid of babies. I do know some that are, but as a general rule, a baby is pretty harmless. A baby usually doesn't create the anxiety that an adult dictator would. And the truth is, when Jesus comes as a baby, he not only came to fulfill prophecy, he came because there is a celebration that happens with birth. There is a joy that comes when that, that woman who said at one point in her pregnancy, Oh, I could be pregnant forever. I just feel so great. Finally sighs and says, I'm ready to be delivered. 
And the joy of not just the delivery, but the joy of being able to hold in your hands. Some of you moms know what I'm talking about. You dads know what I'm talking about. When that which you have waited for becomes a reality and you hold it in your hands. I love the song that was sung and you'll probably hear it this, this Christmas season. Mary, did you know? Did you really get it? Did you really grasp it? Let's just be honest and say, I venture to say that in here, in, in just that human aspect of, oh, I've been delivered, there was a sense of joy. But then to hold that newborn baby, to realize that as she held the baby, it wasn't just the baby. Truly, this was Emmanuel. Jesus would say later in John chapter 10, verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. If there is ever a time where your life is a target of hijacking, kidnapping, being robbed, it is in this holiday season. Black Friday, you're not a sinner if you went out. But Black Friday became Gray Friday. You know why? We can't wait till Friday. And those who know that if we get the jump on Walmart by doing something on Thursday, we'll get your time, your attention, your talent. <laughs> your treasure and you won't have as much to share with Kmart Shopco the truth is this time of year has become a game it's become a competition at the retail level they couldn't wait my wife and son and some of their relatives went out Thursday night just to see. And it lived up to its reputation. <laughs> Crazy. They got some great laughs out of it because it's one thing to be a participant. It's nothing to be a spectator, isn't it? <laughs> you go to these places and people are just doing stuff. And if you're not in line to get what they're after, then you can just sit back and watch. And we as humans can do some prayer the interesting things. <laughs> Jesus said in John chapter 10, he says, I, I came that they might have life. Can I tell you something? He doesn't want your money. He didn't come to target you like retail targets us. He came because there was something at the very core of every human being's life that needed to be dealt with. Let me step into a commercial. You're not gonna change retail. You're not gonna change the focus of advertising. But what you can do is keep the devil from robbing your joy at this time of year. Enjoy the journey through the ads. They're funny. They really are. Enjoy the journey through this several weeks of all this attention for all the wrong reasons. But realize that in Christ, we are insulated from the attacks of the enemy. But we are not at liberty to just check out. Why? Because you see, the celebration must be maintained. The memory cannot get lost in the midst of Black Friday to Gray Friday. The memory of what we are celebrating cannot get lost in all of the different things that want to draw our attention away. Listen, celebrating the news of Christ's birth, and that's your next line there, Celebrating the, the, the Christ's birth is, has got to become a personal celebration. I want you to put your name on that line. Write down your name. 
Include the middle initial in case you share it with somebody else. But realize that he knows your name. And he came. If you were the only sinner on earth, listen, you would have been enough to merit this demonstration of love. And so realize when we celebrate Christmas, we are supposed to celebrate a personal Savior, a personal Messiah. Christ's birth should mean as much to you individually as it does to us corporately. The news of Jesus Christ is a positive declaration. It brings good tidings. Take a moment, if you will, and you fill in that line. What good news do you remember when you first heard about Jesus? For some of you, it may have been, he can take my sins away. For some of you, he, it, it can be, he can erase the past and I can have a future. For some of you, it may have been, he can heal my body. For some of you, he can heal my finances. For some of you, it may have been, finally, someone who can deal with my spouse. But whatever the reason was, Jesus came to bring good news. What's the good news that will be your personal story this Christmas? Lastly, the news of Jesus Christ was not only great because it's personal and positive, but it is universal. Notice the angel said, peace on earth, not just peace in Bethlehem. Peace on earth, not just peace in Idaho Falls. Peace on earth, not just peace in Ammon, Pocatello, the White House, or wherever you may live. It was peace on earth. It was universal. The celebration we have is that God so loved the world. And when we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate a time when the news became public. The news in John 3, 16, which is God so loved the world, is not under a bushel anymore. The news, the great good news that we celebrate of God's great love for mankind is not something that has been banned from the radio. The radio declares it. The TV shows it. The church should be living it out publicly everywhere we go. The great good news of celebrating the news means that we now understand that God loves us. But it's more than just his love for us. It's his presence with us. The good news of peace on earth means the Prince of Peace has come. The implication that now peace can be on earth was not that everybody's going to get along. It was the fact that the Prince of Peace has come and now there's a chance for people to choose life rather than death. To choose, choose peace rather than strife. And the choices you and I have today are still the same. Are we going to let God love us? Are we going to let God be with us? But even greater than God being with us is God being for us. Jeremiah 20, 29, 11 declares, and you, you've heard this over and over, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. And those plans are meant to prosper. They're to be good for us. And if you will simply follow the goodness of God, you can find yourself experiencing the joy of the shepherds, the joy of those who believed, the joy of the apostles, the joy of thousands and thousands and billions of Christians who have made that decision to celebrate and allow Jesus to become an expression of God's love, an expression of God's presence and God going before them. We celebrate at Christmas time salvation. You see, Jesus saves us from something. He doesn't just save us carelessly or causelessly. He saves us from something. Jesus saves us from ourselves. He saves us from sin. And the truth is, if we would really understand this whole concept of Jesus saving us, we would find ourselves able to embrace a self-sacrifice that we hadn't before. 1 John declares that he has come to save us from more than just sin. He come to save us from ourselves. And the reason he's come to save us from sin is because sin has separated us 
from uh, separated God and mankind. There is now a great gulf between man in their fallen state and God in his holiness. And Jesus came to bridge that gap. Many people have said there's many ways to heaven. Unfortunately, that's not true. And fortunately, you're here to be reminded again that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get there without me. And we have got to understand the celebration at this time of year is because now we who were in darkness have seen the light and the light shined for us a way of righteousness. Amen. There is now a joint effort. There is now a joining together. There is now relationship where there was not. Sin caused strife between the woman and the snake. That's what happened at the beginning. You wonder why some of these women don't like snakes? Look back to the very beginning. God declared there would be strife. There would be enmity. There would be a dislike between the snake and between the woman. And for those of you men who don't like snakes, just realize there's a little bit of your feminine side that's coming out. And it's okay. Those of you who happen to like snakes, it's not a sin. Because, listen to me, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but you've got to listen to this. Let me step into a commercial. Once you have been freed from the curse of sin, snakes don't bother you. Why? Because they're no longer an enabler of sin and Satan. They now become the created creation of God. Now that doesn't mean you have to love them. Doesn't mean you have to like them. But if you can see what God has created rather than what the devil destroys, you begin to operate in a clear mind and in a right mind. Snakes are not evil. You know how I know that? Because when God created all the animals in the beginning, he said it was good. The truth is we have got to find ourselves in a renewed state of mind. I'm not going to bring out the snakes and have handled snakes here. Even though we're a Pentecostal church, we don't, we don't, go, we don't get into that. I believe in healthy separation. I believe in God order. But you need to hear me though today. Listen, sin brought a separation between God and man. Sin brought strife between the woman and the snake. Sin brought suffering for both the man when he tilled the ground and for the woman when she gave birth. Sin brought a struggle between man and the ground that to this day we still find ourselves wrestling in this battle and the weeds and all the things that have come up to ultimately infect and destroy the work of our hands. Jesus saves us from sin. He saves us from the curse. He saves us from ourselves so that we can have freedom from. I'd like you to fill in the blank there. I know I'm, I'm asking you to participate here today, but you need to understand this whole concept of Christmas is not meant to be some kind of sideshow that you just sit down, listen to, watch, and then clap your hands and leave and act like nothing's happened. The whole purpose of Christmas is that God would be among us, that we would be called out of darkness into his marvelous light and join in as children of God walking in the kingdom. So answer the question, what are you free from? I encourage you to write it down. What are you free from? I encourage you to nudge your neighbor and say, I'm free from this because of Jesus Christ. It may be guilt from your past. It may be bitterness and resentment. It may be being free from the expectations of others, being free and delivered from an addictive habit or the fear of death. Jesus came to set us free. And I hope you're not tolerating what Jesus died such a high price to deliver us from. What are you free from today? Jesus not only saves us from something, he saves us for something. Jesus saves us for a purpose. He's got a plan. Ephesians tells us that we are his workmanship created from the foundation of the earth to accomplish some things in order that we might be able to rise up and give him glory. We've been talking on Wednesday nights about fruitfulness and I want to declare it again. Your fruitfulness is in direct proportion and connected to your dominion and your freedom. The less fruitful you are, the less dominion you will have. The more fruit you bear, and I'm not talking about just the fruit of the womb. I'm talking about the fruit of the Spirit. 
The more patience you have, the more dominion you will have. The more love you have, the more dominion you will have. The more goodness and mercy, the more faith, the more love, joy, the more dominion you will have. You see, the enemy came to destroy, to steal, and he wants to steal your fruit. And if he can steal your fruit, he then has you as a sitting duck because you are powerless. Jesus came to set us free for something, and it is to be free in him. He gave us a purpose, and I would like you to answer this question by writing one of these down. Jesus has saved you for a purpose. Is it worship? Then write worship down. Is it fellowship? Write fellowship down. Is it discipleship? Means to be like him? Write discipleship down. Is it missions? Write missions down. How many of you found yourself saying yes to all four? He's got something for us to do, doesn't he? In this day of specialization, you know, you got a, you got a foot doctor and you got a hand doctor and you got an eye doctor and you got an ear doctor and you got a back doctor and you got a, you got a financial doctor and you got a relational doctor and you got all these people that are specializing. Jesus is a general practitioner. Yay. He takes care of it all. And if we are going to walk in his footsteps, we got to realize that we were made more than just to sit on a pew. We were made for more than just letting his amazing grace come flood our lives and free us. We were created to worship him. And when you worship him, you are showing God you have tapped in to your original design. We were created for fellowship. That's why we're better together. I saw an ad the other day that talked about being better together. And, I, and my wife looked at me and she said, they stole it from you. <laughs> the truth is it wasn't mine. It was his. So they're going to have to deal with God. But the truth is the world gets this, folks. The world gets this. We're better together. We can do more if we agree. We can do more if we work together. You and I were created for fellowship. Jesus came to establish us in a fellowship. Becoming like him is what the cross is all about. That's why Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. He would love for us to be more like him than we were last year. Jesus saves us by something. We need to remember this. Jesus saves us by his amazing grace. This is part of the joy of of Christmas. We see not only his great power and his great love, but we see unmerited favor when we look into the manger, a feed box. And allow our minds to envision a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. His amazing grace, how sweet the sound, saved a wretch like me. That amazing grace can be wasted. The effect of the cross, the effect of the manger, the wonder of Christmas can fall to nothing. Realize, if you will, today that the whole concept of a Savior coming was because there was something to be saved. And as much as we want to celebrate the Savior, realize that that's not where it ends in just knowing that Jesus came. You go to the mall, you go to the neighborhood, and you will hear people talk about, yes, there was a Jesus that was laid in a manger. But has his life gone to the wayside? Has his death been covered up? And we've lost the celebration of reconciliation. The celebration of reconciliation is one where Jesus offers us peace with God. The reconciliation between God and man is supposed to, is supposed to result in a peace, not condemnation. To be reconciled with God means I now have a relationship A talking relationship. A journeying together that I didn't have before. When a husband and wife find themselves separated because they can't get along. 
And then they find somebody who can balance those two sides out and bring them together. They find themselves able then to be reconciled. That means what was separated is now together. And let me tell you this. If your relationship with God is not a peaceful relationship, you're missing out. The life of Jesus and his death become vain. They become just a story. They become a bother. They can become a guilt, a condemnation. Because Jesus came that we, to offer us peace with God. He came to offer us the peace of God. I would venture to say this will be the greatest challenge for, for some folks, especially the Christians who see the life of Christ constantly being pushed back. The birth of Christ constantly being half-priced. The, the birth of Christ and the, the promises of, of God's word constantly being undermined by all the other things. It is amazing to me how we have given to a, a, figure, a figment of our imagination the same qualities that Christ demonstrated. You see, Jesus knew all things. He knew what was in the heart of man. In John chapter 2 it says, Guess what Santa Claus is supposed to know? Whether you've been naughty or nice. Who are you going to believe? There's a, excuse me, there's a battle out there for your faith. There's a battle out there for what you are going to pledge your allegiance to. Jesus did all things. He did miracles. He did signs. He did wonders. He did incredible things. And our children are being challenged with this concept that a man can fly around the earth behind reindeer who can fly. And folks, I really don't mean to be ridiculous, but let me please. For some people, it will be easier to believe fiction than the truth. They would rather believe that a reindeer could really fly and pull a sleigh with enough toys for every child in the earth in 24 hours than believe that Jesus loved me so much that he came to live for me, die for me, raise again, conquer death for me. For some of you who have been raised in this, this sounds ridiculous, but I'm going to tell you what, with our children believing that, that uh, Hero Brian, that zombies are real, that they're, they're having conversations with these fantasy figures, Last night, two nights ago, three nights ago, over and over and over again, the connection between Christmas, Santa Claus, and magic over and over and over again. They're doing it on purpose. They know that if they can get our children to believe that somehow there's something besides the power of God, there's this magic that can be tapped into, then they'll have a choice between trusting God or trusting the magic. They know that if they can get our young people and our children to put their Christmas list down and mark it out to Dear Santa Claus and some mailman somewhere, this really did happen, I, I did the research, some mailman found the first letter that in America that was written to, uh, to Santa Claus and didn't have the heart to tell this child that he couldn't deliver it. So what did he do? He answered it himself. Do you know how many thousands and millions of individuals have put their wish list down to a figment of imagination? And do you know that now what they're saying is he's only real to those who believe in him? Have you heard that? Am I the only one that's heard that? What are they telling you? They are telling you to spend your God-given faith. Because the Bible says to every man is given a measure of faith. Every child has been given the ability to believe something. What are you going to spend that faith on? That mailman, I will, I'll spare his name. The truth is he's dead. He wrote back to that girl. And all of a sudden, Santa Claus became real.
Jesus came that we might have the peace of God, peace with God, but so much more, peace with others. I don't share these things with you on this first Sunday in December to somehow cause you to rise up and get an anti-Christmas spirit. No, I am telling you that you have got to realize there is a battle going on. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy the very peace of God, the very joy of the Lord, the very thing that brought us salvation. And he does not stop at anything to cause us to be distracted by the things of this world, by things that are not real, by things that cost you your faith, your belief. And in order to be able to leave that, you've got to believe in something else. This believing in something else has caused a lot of division. And as a result, we have people rising up against people. We have individuals striving against each, each other. And listen, the purpose of reconciliation was for you and I to be able to get along because we get along with God. And let me tell you this. If you do not have peace with God, you will struggle at having peace with others. And if you don't have peace with others and you think you have peace with God... You need to read 1 John. Because John said this. If you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. You see, you cannot have peace with God and be out of peace with others. You cannot say that you love God and you hate others. We don't hate the person who happens to spend their faith on a Santa Claus. We don't hate the individual who goes out on Black Friday and camps out all night Thursday just to get that one special thing. We don't hate these individuals. In the words of Mr. T, we pity the fool. <laughs> Those of you who know Mr. T, you laugh, but the rest of you, maybe you get a chance. The truth is we, we do a lot of foolish things. I made comment about that earlier. Black Friday brings out some foolish things in all of us if we spend ourselves that way. Jesus came to bring peace. He came to reconcile. And that is something to celebrate. I want to thank you for joining in in the celebration this morning. It was beautiful to be able to stop singing and hear the songs still rolling around this place. Why? Because we get it. Jesus came. He came not only to provide salvation, but I have tasted of that salvation. And now my soul can sing and declare the truth of this time, the truth of what we have set aside. We know, I hope you know this, maybe I should not be so assumptive. The truth is, Jesus was not born on December 25th. Just in case you missed that. Jesus was not born on December 25th. Amen. Now you can either get angry or you can say, because of the times. To everything, remember Ecclesiastes, to everything there is a season and a time. Your neighbors have set aside time to put out lights, spend money, spend time. What are you going to do? Sit back and hate them? Sit back and whine about all the electricity that could be spent in Africa helping kids get food? Or are you going to say, Lord, help me to be a light for you? As bright as the commercialism shined, let Jesus shine in us even brighter. Amen? Amen? Jesus came to reconcile us, to redeem us, to restore us at peace with God, to the peace of God, and at peace with one another. Reconciliation is not resolution. Please hear me. Reconciliation is not resolution. Reconciliation, this is your last blank, second to last blank, stops hostility. Reconciliation eliminates the barrier. It stops the hostility so that we can finally talk. You see, this is what the psalmist David declared in Psalms 23 when he said, You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Reconciliation doesn't mean resolution. We haven't figured it out yet. But the truth is, when I'm talking to God, then we can figure out where we go from here. Reconciliation is good for man's relationship with God. Amen? Amen. Man's relationship with, uh, excuse me, reconciliation is good for man's relationship with others. Amen? Amen. 
Reconciliation is good for man's relationship with animals. Amen? Amen. That was weak. <laughs> let, me, let me go back to my commercial. God created everything, right? And all things were good, right? You see, under the curse, there's this thing called sin that separates us from God's original design as well as God's original blessing. Animal abuse and misuse is a judgment on the Creator and a judgment that will rest on you and I. Please hear me. As Christians, we are not free. Having dominion does not mean we abuse what was so freely given. Let me say it again. <laughs> Having dominion does not mean we abuse what was so freely given. Amen. I hope we get that. So reconciliation means I have stepped out of the curse, out of the hate, out of the enmity, and now I walk in the love of God. Have you ever heard or met somebody who just, they were just so full of the Lord, they loved everything. And you didn't like it? You ever had somebody who was so full of joy that it rubbed you the wrong way? The truth is, we have an opportunity in this time to be reconciled to God, not just so we can have this wonderful relationship with the Creator, but so that we can enjoy a relationship with creation. Having power does not give you license. It gives you liberty. Having power to do something doesn't mean you should do something. Can I get an amen? Amen. Just because you can, I shared this several weeks ago, doesn't mean you should. Just because you have the ability to and the opportunity doesn't mean you should. Matter of fact, you are a stronger, greater person, more an example of Christ's likeness when in the face of unforgiveness, you choose to forgive. When in the face of impatience, when you've about had it, you're done suffering, you're going to write this person off, you choose to give one more day. You choose to be one day longer in your suffering. You choose to be patient. You choose to be gentle. You choose to be kind. That's what Jesus did, right? Amen. Reconciliation gives us an opportunity to work these things out. And this is why we celebrate Christmas. Lastly, reconciliation is, man's, uh, is good for man's relationship with the earth. And let me just say it again. Just because it has been freely given to us, life on earth does not give us license to abuse what God established. The earth is not here for us to dispose of. It is meant for us to participate with. Next three weeks, we're going to talk about going green. Just kidding. <laughs> but let me tell you this man's arrogance and pride has done so much in the face of the creator that will not be a compliment to our intelligence that's a big way of saying we haven't always done it right but because of Jesus because of Christmas because of the baby in a manger I don't have to keep doing it wrong I can start living right. I can begin to say, Lord, not my way, your way. I can begin to celebrate this season that has been set aside by our culture, by our government, by different entities that are out there. Even if Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, shouldn't every day be a day of joy because Jesus has come into my heart? Amen. So on the day that the world gives you a day off, on the Christmas break that you get from school, on the time we choose to get together as families, let's remember the purpose of Christmas has already been established. Now the choice is yours. How will you spend the days that you're given? For to every, everything on earth, there is a time and there is a season. 
And my prayer today, as you consider this, is that you will spend this Christmas wisely. Now you'll notice there at the end of your message notes, I want to challenge you with what you're going to do with this message. Now that you know that we should celebrate as Christians, what are you going to do? Now that you know that the news of the birth is meant to be personal, what are you going to do with that news? Meant to be positive and universal, what are you going to do with that news? Now that you know that we should celebrate the salvation, celebrate God's love for us, God with us, and God for us, what are you going to do with that? What are you going